Hello everyone, uh, today I'm going to talk about Gamma, Rama, Garma, Multimodal Energy Here is the Mantra. My name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh. I work as a consultant in anesthesia at the Royal Liverpool University Hospitals. Now you must be wondering why I'm showing you this uh, image of children crossing the road. This is a story in some of the areas in India uh, where children cross the rivers every day uh, to go to school. But we could actually provide them boats. But the boats have to be manned by people and there is going to be you know, times when they will not be available to them. Or we could actually bring, you know, build bridges across the rivers and this will allow children to cross the road without depending on anyone. They could actually come and go as they wish. So you must be wondering, what's the point in this? The point is, be greater than average. And to be greater than average, you need to work differently. You need to work intelligently. So Rama, Gamma and Garam, what are these? So Rama is basically regional anesthesia combined with multimodal anesthesia. GA plus MMA is Gamma. And when you combine GA and regional anesthesia, that is Gara with multimodal anesthesia, which is one of my favorite techniques, it will become Garma. Garma is also uh, in our language, Hindi, it is garam, garam, or garam is hot. Okay, so there's something which is very hot, like a hot topic. So GA plus multimodal analgesia makes sense because we all know GA is opiate-based anesthesia. Analgesia has always been opiate-based traditionally. And there are other components like amnesia, hypnosis, and muscle relaxant as part of general anesthesia. But then opiates are not the solution to all problems. Opiates have their own problems. They are associated with lots of complications like respiratory depression, pharyngeal muscle weakness, negative inotropism, PONV, ILS, urinary retention, and whatnot. So there is obviously problem across the world uh, with opiates. There's problems with procuring in developing countries. There is problem with legalization in developing countries. And there is a problem of addiction in uh, US, in UK, and other places where opiates are freely used as part of analgesia. So we have tried to move towards opiate based, uh, sorry, opiate free anesthesia from opiate based anesthesia, or so which we also call alpha. And there have been many reasons why alpha has become more. Uh, fashionable. Uh, one thing was obviously uh, related to the early recovery after surgery. Then others were related to uh, sort of getting rid of the complication associated uh, with opioids. Regional based anesthesia relies mainly on regional anesthesia which provide analgesia and it provides anesthesia to that region where the surgery is going to be. So when we talk about Rama and Garama, he says, uh, why is multimodal analgesia necessary with regional anesthesia when it is providing the anesthesia to the local part and it is providing good analgesia? You look at, the, look at this eyes, can you see the pain? The pain comes from higher centers as well. This is the emotional aspect of pain, which we are not taking care of with regional anesthesia. In a publication in 2000, Cousins, Power and Smith actually wrote this statement. It said that it remains a common mis misconception amongst clinicians that acute post-operative pain is transient condition. No, it is not transient. It goes on for, you know, days and weeks. And it obviously has got this tendency to become a persistent post-surgical pain or chronic pain if we don't deal with it appropriately. 
the chemical mediators which are released in acute pain, that is in response to any injury, are no different from what we talk about in the mediators in chronic pain. So prostaglandins, 4-hydroxytryptamine, that is serotonin, bradykinin, histamine, calcitonin gene-related peptides, substance P, these are all there uh, in acute pain as well as in chronic pain. And tissue trauma is, is associated with physical, that we all know, but also cognitive and emotional discomfort. So when you're doing regional anesthesia, you're taking care of the physical part. You're not taking part of the cognitive and emotional discomfort, which is associated with the tissue injury. When you're doing regional anesthesia, you are actually blocking this at the spinal level. Okay. You're not realizing that the pain actually ascends. And it actually ascends via the ascending pathway and goes to the, to the cerebral cortex through the diffuse projection to postcentral gyrus, to hypothalamus, to amygdala, where all the emotional aspect uh, of the pain is integrated. Okay. So we need to take care of not only the local part, but also the central part of pain. If you don't relieve pain postoperatively, which can happen uh, with regional anesthesia, uh, once the local anesthetic you have given the spinal anesthesia wears off, or once your local anesthetic wears off from your blocks, okay. if you do not take care of the postoperative pain, which can be very severe uh, when your local anesthesia actually wears off, can lead to clinical and psychological changes which are associated with increased morbidity and mortality, increased cost, and reduction in the quality of life. So, how big is the problem of acute postoperative pain? Warfield and Kahn in 1995 did a study and found that three out of four patients actually woke up with pain. Now, that is very significant. And 80% of these patients actually had moderate to severe pain. Again, very significant. So that was in 1995, down the year in 2003. Affelbaum also did a study to look at acute postoperative pain, and he also found that moderate to severe pain was present in 80% of the patients that is post in the postoperative period. Then Coming back to 2014, TJ Khan also actually studied acute postoperative pain, and this is what he found. He said that 86% of the patient experienced pain in the postoperative period. Of this 86%, 75% of them had moderate to extreme pain in the immediate post-surgical period. And 74% of the patients were being discharged to the ward with pain. So these patients still actually were suffering from pain after they were discharged from the ward. So like I have already mentioned, acute pain does impact patients' lives. It increases the hospital stay. Because if you do not manage pain properly intraoperatively, then you have to manage in the post-operative period, you have to use opioids or other analgesic which may be associated with complications like not post up nose and vomiting. So their stay in the recovery increases because they're still vomiting or have other side effects. They may they cannot be discharged home. Or even if they're discharged home, they might actually come back to the accident emergency department for readmission. Also, there is a reduction in the quality of life because of the pain, they cannot function normally. There is impaired physical functioning. There is reduction in functional recovery. Obviously, there is increased complication and pain doesn't allow them to sleep. And this has been seen in multiple studies throughout. It has also been seen that inadequate acute pain management can move on to chronic pain in almost 50% of the patients. Now, that's not good. Again, proven by multiple studies. 
Why does this happen? That's because of the peripheral sensitization. The tissue damage, the inflammation, the activation of sympathetic afferents or efferents actually create the sensitizing soup. All those kind of uh, you know, mediators are released, which actually convert the high threshold nociceptor to low threshold nociceptor. So now these nociceptors now respond to innocuous pain. And if this winding up actually continues, peripheral sensitization continues, this will progress to either persistent post-surgical pain or to chronic pain. So what is the role of multimodal therapy in this? How can we use multimodal therapy so that patients do not suffer? So in 2012, ASC Task Force on Acute Pain Management produces practice guidelines for management of acute pain in the post-operative setting. They define multimodal therapy as synchronous administration of two or more pharmacological agents, so this agents, or approaches, each with a distinct mechanism of action. So it's not that giving morphine and then fentanyl, that comes to the same group. You need to be actually using two different agents, okay, from different categories, so non-steroids for opiates or paracetamol for non-steroids, or giving nerve blocks of that. So it's about more than two pharmacological agents or approaches. They also said that we need to be targeting different pain pathways. Okay, so not only looking at peripheral, but also spinal or central methods. And use synergism of these multiple agents, which will allow for dose reduction of individual agents, and thus reduce the risk of adverse effects from individual agents. They had few key practice guideline recommendations which are very important. First of them actually said that anesthesiologist or anesthetist uh, should be using regional anesthesia techniques like epidural or intrathecal opioids. Or if the patients can't actually get epidural or intrathecal opioids, then use systemic opioids as patient control analgesia. And use regional anesthesia techniques like peripheral nerve blocks or even local infiltration uh, to improve post-operative pain management. It also said that the analgesics, simple analgesics like non-steroidals or COX inhibitors and paracetamol should be given round the clock. Okay. And the dosing regimen should be understood to optimize efficacy while minimizing the risk of adverse events. And that's only possible if you combine multiple agents. Okay. And the choice of medication, the dose, route, and duration of therapy, therapy need to be individualized. So not all patients can. For example, some patients may not be able to directly take non-steroidals. In that case, can we use a different group of non-steroidals or use something else in, instead of non-steroidals in these patients? So pain prevention team or preventing pain actually involves everybody. It involves the surgeons, it involves the nurses, it involves anesthetists, physiotherapists, psychotherapists, but also involves the patient as well. Okay. So patient has to be part of this management. Nociceptive uh, stimulation or nerve injury leading to pain involves neuroplasticity. That is affected by the genetic buildup of the patient, the age of the patient, the memory that is based on the experience, previous experiences, their mental state, their activity states. Okay, these all factors affect the pain globally. And this is then modified by the anesthesia we use, adjuvants we use, and also the surgical techniques used uh, for particular operations. So multiple modal therapy actually starts from the periphery, goes to the spinal cord, through the brainstem and to the central nervous system that involves the limbic cortex, you know, that is uh, the emotional aspect, the sensory cortex where we sense the pain, the, and the thalamus. Okay. So we should be able to actually use all various agents at different levels. So whether using local infiltration at the site of the operation, anti-inflammatory agents act where there is inflammation, okay. giving no blocks locally, using opiates and other local anesthesia spinal level, 
and also giving agents that actually act at the central level. Okay, so we need to utilize agents which act at all different levels. So multimodal uh, therapy in practice, how we can practically use, and this, that's what I'm going to discuss now. And if you look at my armamentarium of, for multimodal analgesia, there are no opiates involved in this. In our setup, even Tremadol at least kept in the CD cutter. It's locked up, okay, so you'll have to really sign for it. So these agents are freely available in your cart. So you have local anesthesia for giving blocks or spinal for epidural or infiltration. You have non steroidals like your diclofenac IV. You have lidocaine, which you can use IV, magnesium sulfate. Okay, catapress or the uh, clonidine is available to us. Dexmatomidine is very costly. It's not available freely to us. Dexamethasone, freely available to us. But if you actually have to use ketamine or tramadol, you will actually have to sign for it and get it out from the CD cupboard. But these are easily available to us. So we will look at uh, examples. Like, for example, we will take a simple surgery like a hernia repair. Now, where are we going to do a mesh repair? So to provide appropriate analgesia and anesthesia, we need to understand this surgical anatomy. So we need to actually look at what kind of uh, the uh, hernia it is. Is it a, a direct hernia, indirect hernia, or femoral hernia? Uh, you'll also see there are actually nerves involved. So you can actually see that the iliovenal nerve uh, moves along uh, with the cord. Okay. Then there is a little hypogastric nerve that may, may be involved uh, in the, uh, the incision or in the scar tissue. Okay. So if you look at components of hernia repair, uh, it involves ligation of the hernial sac. It may involve that the surgeon might actually have to cut through the nerve. If one of the surgeon does it regularly, he cuts through the healing one nerve. The nerves can get entrapped in the mesh or in the scar tissue. Again, it depends whether the surgeon is, where is the surgeon actually fixing uh, your mesh? Is it taking a bite uh, through the periosteum, which can lead to periosteitis? What is the approach? Is this an open approach? Okay, is it open repair? Or oh, this is a laparoscopic repair that also actually, you know, affects the you know, outcomes. Then there is experience of the surgeon, how good he is at dissecting the area. Also experience of the anesthetist, can the anesthetist give nerve blocks? Okay. Okay. Are they experienced enough to use regional anesthesia techniques? The complications associated with the surgery, whether we're introducing foreign material, if we're using a mesh or using tax. Again, I explain about periostitis, and obviously there is going to be, uh, you know, the sonia can be going along the sac and it can cause arthritis. So all this can cause uh, pain relief uh, or pain uh, or need pain relief as well. So there is is my inguinal honey repair analgesia plan, depending on the basic setup, intermediate setup, or advanced setup. At one setup, you got everything. You got nerve stimulators, you got ultrasound guided, you got uh, opiates, you got everything. So we're not going to talk about this. Intermediate setup, they might actually have, uh, you know, some of these things. But here we're going to talk about basic setup or rural setup or setup where there are limited resources. Can we actually provide good multimodal analgesia and anesthesia in a limited resource centers? So normally, we all start off with a checklist. We then apply the monitoring. We secure an IV axis. Then comes the induction, which provides calmness induction. And then you insert a supraglottic device. And you leave the patient to breathe spontaneously. You monitor the vitals. Okay. Once the patient is stable enough, okay, it's established on the thing, you fix your supraglottic device. Then 
you are going to uh, give them IV dexamethasone because in awake patient this causes quite a lot of discomfort so you do not want to actually give dexamethasone when patient is awake. Same thing Voltrol. Voltrol IV is very painful giving through IV exit. You need to dilute it so minimum dilution of 20 ml or you can actually put it in a 100 ml bag and run it slowly so you need to actually give this so soon after that this is done. So uh, while I'm preparing uh, for my block, okay, this has all been delivered. So next step is actually to do the blocks. Now uh, people do classical approach. Uh, classical approach involves, uh, you know, two centimeters from the anterospilic spine going medially and upwards or downwards. Now if you use this landmark uh, at this level, the iliogonal nerve actually has, uh, you know, pierced the internal oblique and lies now. Uh, between the external oblique and internal oblique. So you need to deposit a local anesthetic in two planes. So you need to deposit in the top plane as well as that is a plane between the internal oblique and transverse abdominis as well as from internal oblique and the external oblique. So it's better you do that. But also at the same time if you are directly blocking here you are going to miss out the little cutaneous branch and hence you will likely have to ask the surgeon to do a local infiltration of his incision site. So classical honey block may not provide you most appropriate anesthesia. So what we have described is this landmark where both these nerves are lined together in a single plane. This is the approach, this is ilinganal and ilohepatic nerve block in the transverse abdominis plane. For this, you need to actually mark the anterospilic spine, go two inches or five centimeters cranially, and then from that point, go two inches or five centimeters posteriorly and that point, this point actually lies almost in the mid axillary line over the iliac crest. So when you go there, you do exactly like you will perform a tap block, you will feel two pops and deposit local anesthetic here. At this level, in most patients, 99% of patients, both the nerves, iliohepigastric iliohepigastric line here and you will also catch the lateral cutaneous branches as well. Okay. okay. So we're going to do right angle honey block there. So you can see that I'm marking that anticephalic spine two inches about two inches on the uh, posteriorly. So you go five centimeter cranially, five centimeter posteriorly, and then you look for two pops. So you go through that and you actually feel for the two pops through that. And I have used a nerve stimulation here. And I can likely see that there is twitching of the abdominal muscles as well. So you can use nerve stimulation to stimulate the ilingual iliohypogastric nerves as well. And as soon as you inject the local anesthetic, the uh, twitches will uh, disappear. Okay. So uh, this is the ilingual and iliohypogastric nerve block in the transverse abdominis plane. When you're doing hernia surgery, you also need to block the spermatic cord and spermatic cord block can also be done by anesthetics, but better left to the surgeons. The surgeons can always infiltrate local anesthetic uh, while they have dissected tissues. So uh, you can always ask the surgeons to do this block. So once the blocks are done and the patient is now ready for the surgeon, during this time you can then also give infusion of uh, magnesium sulfate. The dose for magnesium sulfate is 50 mg per kg body weight. Why magnesium sulfate? You can actually read about this or, or listen to this in my lecture on acute pain management. It's an MD receptor blocker and it's very very important that it works locally at the spinal as well as central level. Okay. So 50 milligrams, say if you have 70 kg man, so that's come to 3.5 grams. And each 2 ml is 1 gram. So you're looking at around 3 to 4 ampules. Not 1, but 3 to 4 ampules. Okay, so 3 ampules is 12 millimoles, 4 ampules is 16 millimoles. So you're looking at 12 to 16 millimoles. Uh, that need to be delivered slowly. Okay, you don't want to give them as a bolus. So tend to actually mix these in a liter of plasmolite or ringolactate. That's the fluid I'm going to give through. So this is going to go slowly over the you know, hours, over hours. So it's not given as soon on the surgency. Uh, once the surgery is over, towards the end of the surgery, around 20 minutes before the 
uh, skin closure or acetylopatrin on paracetamol, IV paracetamol. And the patient actually wakes up as a combination of this, they do wake up. Now, if you think your block hasn't worked very well or you think you have missed a segment, you can also use a mix which I have described wherein you give one gram of paracetamol along with 25 to 50 milligrams of tramadol. So in a small build patient or a female patient, you don't need more than 25 milligrams of tramadol. Now, the other advantage of giving uh, tramadol is so it not only uh, you know, provides analgesia, yeah, but giving this uh, small dose slowly does not cause nausea and vomiting as is associated with bigger doses. So you're not giving us a bolus because you'll be giving this over 20 minutes along with the infusion, you do not see any nausea and vomiting associated with tramadol. At the same time, uh, tramadol also reduces the shivering that is associated with cold. You know, the patient tend to drop their temperature in the operation theater. It reduces shivering as well. Lignocan can be used in cases where you can't give blocks. Okay. In these cases, like you can actually use lignocan at one milligram per kg bolus. This can be followed by 40 microgram per kg per meter infusion during the surgery. This is then reduced to 0.5 to 1 milligram per minute. So almost you're looking only at around 30 to 60 milligrams per hour. Thank you. And then you continue this into the recovery and the post of day one. And if you look at the post of day one, you also need to make sure that the patient directly started on once they start taking orally, then you start them or other oral analgesics as well, like oral paracetamol or ibuprofen. You also need to monitor patients for signs of toxicity like tinnitus, perioral numbness, cardiac arrhythmia, dysrhythmias. And second post of day, you actually discontinue on the same. So it goes on to first post of day. You can use this. So I said that the tramadol we use, we only use around 20 to 50 milligrams. The rest of the 75 to uh, you know, 50 milligram, which is left, it's better to actually dilute it into 10 mLs and keep it for post-operative uh, pain. So once the patient has woken up, and if there is still pain, you can actually use this as small bolus. 10 to 20 milligram IV boluses actually work really well uh, for residual pain relief or acidosky analgesics. So like I said, if you are unable to actually do blocks, you can use IV lignocaine. You can also ask the surgeon to do a local infiltration and the local infiltration need to be done at the beginning of the surgery not at the end then there is no point uh, if you do in the end the analgesia lasts for a very short duration but what I were experiencing that the analgesia lasts for maybe for four to six hours but if you do it before the incision then the analgesia can last for 14 to 18 hours and giving IV dexamethasone improves the duration of analgesia not only with the nerve blocks but also with local infiltration. So you don't actually have to give it mixed with the local anesthetic, giving it IV. Uh, not only prolongs your analgesia, it also prevents your nausea and vomiting. So you're already giving one antiemetic uh, for the patient, so you're reducing the risk. Anyway, you should be uh, assessing the patient in terms of AFL scores for their uh, risk for post of nausea and vomiting and treat it accordingly. And also, if you are not able to give the blocks or for whatever reasons, uh, soon after induction, you can also now give the paracetamol and tramadol mix at the very beginning itself. Okay, so you don't actually wait towards the end. You can actually give at the beginning of the surgery as well. In the recovery, do not forget uh, to prescribe pain relief and post of nausea and vomiting. So you have already used dexamethasone. You can then prescribe them for ondocitron and stematil if you like. Post of instruction for the ward and home need to be very, very clear. One thing, if the patient is able to take by mouth, the patient should be actually encouraged to take their oral painkiller mm -hmm. by mouth. Second thing is that the analgesia in the first 48 to 30, 36 to 48 hours should be given by the club. It need to be regular, you do not give them analgesia per demand because the oral analgesic you are going to use are going to take time to reach their pain relief levels in the blood and there will be delay in the analgesia delivered to the patient. 
You can actually uh, prescribe patients with simple analgesic like paracetamol. Uh, the dose is one gram, okay, not 500 milligram. It is in the adults, the dose is one gram every six hours and maximum four grams in 24 hours, okay. The ibuprofen should be given at a dose of 400 milligrams every eight hourly, okay. There are fixed dose multimodal combination available easily in the market, like Tremacet, as you know, paracetamol and Tremadol combination, fantastic combination, can be used along with non-steroidals like ibuprofen to provide excellent analgesia in the post-operative period. Astamin, the uh, paracetamol and tramadol uh, combination can be given four times a day. Ibuprofen three times a day along with food. And it's better to actually uh, take the non sterols with food to reduce the acidity. Okay. If the patient is not uh, able to take orally, you will not discharge the patient home, obviously. So in the ward, you can continue giving them uh, one gram of paracetamol every six hourly along with 25 to 50 milligrams of tramadol. You can also use uh, IV daclofenac. Um, so the dose is uh, 75 milligrams tool hourly. You should never exceed more than 150 milligrams in 24 hours, non steroidals. And if you're giving a uh, non steroidal, don't forget to prescribe PPIs so omeprazole, pentaprazole, asmoprazole, lenzaprazole, what is it, whatever is available to you, you can actually prescribe them to reduce the acid. Uh, uh, you know, acidity. So we describe uh, now as an example, describe how you would actually conduct multimodal analgesia uh, in terms of the you know, hernia, a common simple procedure. What about other abdominal procedures like for example laparoscopic surgeries? You have to remember that uh, the even simple surgery like ventral hernia repair or paraumbilical hernia repair. It can be done open uh, surgery, so you need to know from the surgeon what approach are they going to use. You can either look at the incision is different, the pore sites are different for laparoscopic incision, and if it has been done robotically, the pore sites again are different from the laparoscopic uh, incision. So you need to actually know the surgical anatomy very well. You also need to find out if the surgeons are going to use mesh along with tacks. Now tacks go into the abdominal wall and these can cause severe post-operative pain. So you need to be, even if it is a laparoscopic surgery, small parts, you say, okay, you can give local infiltration, but don't forget tacks can be, you know, very painful. So main blocks that anyone can master using loss of You don't need a nerve stimulator, you don't need an ultrasound, but you can actually master them. Okay, all you need is a blunt needle. Okay, so this is one of the techniques used to blunt the needle. So on the right side, the green one is a 21G hypodermic needle. On the left side, a short barrel blunt needle. Okay, you can then actually bend it into like a parrot beak. This is uh, on myself, my skin, and this is on my hand. Can you see that, that it does not pierce? Okay, this is actually, I'm applying quite a bit of pressure on my hand, and it does not actually go through it. This is called a cushion effect, which happens, and I will describe what exactly cushion effect is. So basically, you can use uh, the uh, needles, uh, which actually have a short bevel. These are... Uh, you know, uh, difficult pairs, so they give you good loss of resistance. You can use hypodermic needle, but for that you need to modify it. You need to actually convert them into a parrot beak. You need to blunt the tip or convert them to a parrot tip. You can use epidural needle, two heat point needle. You can use pencil point needles. Uh, the spinal needles can be used. And I'm going to show that uh, with blocks, how these can be actually used. So blunt tips, short bevel needles, they do not pierce the skin very easily because we have thick skin, all of us. The skin is actually has got a lot of raciness. You require a great force to actually pierce through the skin, okay, rule like rhino scales. And this is what it does. So when you apply a greater pressure with a blunt needle, the skin squashes the fat and there is the, your, the tissues come 
closer together, okay, this cross me. And uh, when you try to feel it pop, so when you go through the skin, you might be actually going through the first uh, layer of the fascia, okay. So it's like your head actually getting buried in the cushion, so that's why I actually call this a cushion effect. This is described in uh, my article on loss of resistance from 2011. Okay. So this is uh, we're showing the we can actually see that okay I'll play it again there you go okay that's that is the cushion effect you need to apply you can actually see how the skin when it pours it actually takes time to actually go through okay okay so to um, uh, you know how do you how do you get uh, without actually causing cushion effect. So if you're using a uh, palette big needle, then you need to introduce a needle at an acute angle. So you use the, the sharp tip uh, to pierce the skin. And once the skin is pierced, then you can actually then uh, change it over to 90 degrees. And then when you go in, you actually feel the bounce and the resistance of the fascia very well. Okay. Or you can use a needle through needle technique in which you use an introducer sharp introducer through the skin and the fat and then introduce the blunt or pencil point needle through that. So some spinal needles actually come with the introducer. These are actually then uh, useful uh, for these kind of blocks. Okay. So coming to some other uh, abdominal blocks and uh, surgeries and blocks. First thing very important for abdominal uh, surgeries is to understand the anatomy of the abdomen. So here we're talking about the you know, transverse abdominus plane and the plane through which the nerves actually move. So this plane lies uh, below the internal oblique fascia. Okay, so just not under the muscle, internal oblique muscle, but under the internal oblique fascia and it lies between the fascia and the transverse abdominus plane. Okay. And rectus sheath is covered by anterior and posterior rectus sheath and when we do the blocks we tend to actually have the local anesthetic deposited over the posterior rectus sheath, not under it. The other anatomy we need to know is about the caudatus lumborum, okay, and the transverse abdominis upper neurosis or TF in neurosis. So this is where the nerves actually pierce uh, the transverse abdominis upper neurosis and then move into the uh, the trap plane. I'll show you that in a minute, okay. So that's that is the posterior wall. So the posterior wall uh, not only consists of the uh, fascia uh, from the internal oblique, which has split into two, uh, but also the uh, fascia transversalis. So there are two fascias, uh, which lies in the posterior part of the abdominal muscle. So when we are depositing the uh, local anesthetic, we need to deposit it under uh, the muscle, but over the fascia. This causes kind of a tram lines which is normally actually seen in the ultrasound so well. You also have to actually remember that the rectus sheath is not uh, constant, okay, it actually is different at different places. So if you look at a zipphoid level, uh, there is no posterior rectus sheath, there is only anterior abdominal sheath. And if you go below the zipphoid, so between the zipphoid and the umbilicus, you actually see anterior and posterior sheath. So the anterior sheath is, is tougher because it has got the external oblique fascia as well as the fascia of the internal oblique which has split into anterior and posterior sheath. So anterior sheath is always very tough. Okay, As you go below the arcuate line, the anterior rectus sheath is very tough right, because it has got three layers of it. And there is no posterior rectus sheath uh, below the arcuate line. Okay. Also, you have to be careful with the inferior epigastric artery, which actually lies in this plane. So, looking at the uh, the nerve uh, as it originates, it passes anterior to the cordyceps lumborum, and at the transverse abdominis aponeurosis point, it actually pierces the fascia, and then actually moves into the into the internal oblique sorry, below the internal oblique fascia in the transverse abdominis plane. Okay, so the nerve lies below the internal oblique fascia and above the transverse abdominis plane. So if you deposit local anesthetic above the internal oblique fascia, you're not going to get a good block at all. Okay, this is showing how the nerve directly moves in the uh, your internal oblique fascia 
uh, gives a branch of the anterior cutaneous uh, branches. It also actually gives the lateral cutaneous uh, branches. And so it's very important at what point you are actually going to deposit your local anesthetic. So when the local anesthetic is deposited posteriorly in the, uh, you know, transverse abdominis plane, and then you actually get a good block. You will actually catch a little cutaneous as well. So abdominal, uh, transverse abdominis plane or tab block uh, is normally given in the mid axillary line. Uh, people tend to actually give it uh, sort of midway between the costal iliac crest. And um, uh, this actually only blocks the iliomenal uh, and leuhepagastric nerves in 33% of the time. Also, when you're actually uh, blocking this, you may not actually catch the little cutaneous branches as well. So these are not covered. And neither are the T10 and other branches. So it's not a very good approach. It might catch some of the higher branches, but those can be you know, covered by a rectal sheath block. So the other approach is the classical approach where you go at the mid axillary line just above the iliac crest and this tends to actually block your lateral cutaneous subcostal iliopigastric iliomonal T10. So this is at the pathis triangle, the classical pathis triangle uh, level. So this is actually a good block. The other block uh, which is uh, very uh, similar to pathis triangle but slightly anterior to it is the iliomonal iliopigastric nerves in the transverse abdominis plane. So for this antispilic spine, we remove 5 centimeter uh, cranially and then 5 centimeter posterly at this point. And this is the iliovenal and iliohepigastric nerve block at the, uh, in the transverse abdominis plane. So this will likely block uh, the iliovenal and iliohepigastric branches. You can actually also do a posterior tap block. Some people actually also call it scordatus lumbar block. Uh, wherein you actually pierce the uh, transverse abdominis aponeurosis, okay, and deposit local anesthetic there, and uh, that will actually catch the nerves uh, before they move into the transverse abdominis plane. The spread is, is considered to be a lot more extensive here, and you get uh, the lingual heliohepigastric subcostal T10. You get you catch most of the nerves. So it's a good block. Okay. There are other, other uh, things we need to know is the all the uh, various uh, surface marking, costal margin, lateral margin of the uh, rectus abdominis. You can actually see it is actually wider at the top than at the umbilicus level. And then there's always linea alba and the umbilicus. So the four is a four quadrant tap. So people actually get, often I get asked, what is a four quadrant tap? So when you actually give tap block in under the subcostal margin, uh, about the iliac crest, obviously you're going to do it bilaterally, and uh, so that becomes four quadrant. So uh, tab block just below the costal margin, tab block above the iliac crest on both sides. That is a four quadrant tab. Then there is a four point rectus sheath block. Okay, so this is not four quadrant. In this case, we are actually going to divide the abdomen into four quadrants above the umbilicus. So between the zephy sternum and the umbilicus, you're going to divide. So the lateral margin of rectus abdominis, linea alba, umbilicus, the xiphoid, this is all. So four quadrants, one, two, three, four. And you actually then deposit local anesthetic uh, over the posterior rectus sheath in these four quadrants. Okay. The reason being that, uh, you know, anteriorly there are tendinous intersections uh, they do not. They do not actually go to the posterior sheath, so they won't actually uh, cause any problems. So the local acid would normally spread. But what we have seen uh, with our experience with ultrasound, that local anesthetic, like in children, where you can actually just go on one point and when you actually injure local anesthetic spreads all over the posterior rectus sheath, it does not happen in adults. So it's better to actually inject local anesthetic at four points in adult patients. There are always some kind of additions always present in there. So deposit local anesthetic at four points. So like I said, uh, you in rectus sheath block, you need to actually go through the anterior rectus sheath, uh, which gives you a nice, uh, uh, you know, loss of resistance, go through the muscle, and then feel a bounce over the posterior wall uh, or the posterior rectus sheath. Uh, you do not pierce this posterior rectus sheath. You just remain on that and deposit local anesthetic under the rectus abdominis muscle and over the posterior rectus sheath. 
So what blocks do we need for different things? We're going to now discuss briefly because this is important. Like I said, it's important to know the surgical anatomy. Now this is an incision which you normally actually see in open cholestectomy. It may not be such a big incision for some experienced uh, surgeons. But this is a cocker sensation and obviously if, if you actually are like, looking at that, then you give rectus sheath blocks on both sides because the incision can not only extend to the other side one. Second thing is that there is crossover of the nerves uh, segments can always occur. So on the top, give the rectus sheath block on both sides and that block just under the costal margin okay, can be used. You can also use uh, paravertebral blocks. Okay. You can use rectus spina block as well if you actually are comfortable with them. This is a midline laparotomy, and uh, in this case, you would have to need to actually give four quadrant rectus sheath block, so that will cover the top part, the bottom part of the uh, rectus also. And then you can actually use classical tap blocks on both sides uh, to cover the midline. You would need large volume, so in this case, you need to be careful with the local anesthetic. A lot of times, 0.25% chirocaine is, or liver pupivacaine, uh, is good enough, uh, but sometimes you might have to further dilute it. So the volume is important. Do not exceed 2 mg per kg of uh, liver bipivacaine or bipivacaine. Just dilute it to that volume using saline or distilled water. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so for incision below the umbilicus, okay, lower abdominal laparotomy uh, is sometimes done, not very common. In that case, you can actually de do a rectus sheath block. This is like your paraumbilical block. So you will actually deposit local anesthetic just above the umbilicus on the either side. You go just go around four centimeters or so from the uh, center and deposit local anesthetic like a rectus sheath block. So go through the anterior rectus sheath. Uh, fill uh, for the bounce or the posterior rectus sheath and deposit local anesthetic and also do the classical tap blocks. Okay. Uh, for a final still incision following uh, the caesarean section, uh, you can use iliogonal iliohepicastry block or classical tap block in the, the, uh, the uh, uh, top. Okay. Yeah. The triangle of petite uh, uh, block. So that is also very good. So it's, a, it's like a posterior uh, tab block, classical tab block uh, in the uh, triangle of petite. Uh, for uh, this kind of incision, this is a paramedian incision, vertical paramedian incision, because it's one side, then all you need to do is actually do the rectus sheath block and tab block uh, on uh, just one side. So that's the greatest advantage of the vertical paramedian incision. You don't actually have to do the bilateral uh, blocks. Uh, now incision for classical incision for appendix surgery. Uh, so it could be McBurney classical and modified incision for appendectomy. In this case, either you can use a, a tab block, posterior tab block or uh, the uh, cordatus lumbar block where you actually pierce the uh, uh, your transverse abdominus aponeurosis and deposit local anesthetic posteriorly gives a wider incision, like a spread of local anesthetic. Uh, this is hernia surgery. We have already actually discussed that. You actually can see the uh, you know spermatic cord here. There. So, uh, iliogonal block and tap plane is the uh, preferred that. Uh, tap block uh, on its own has got higher failures. Uh, this is a paramblical surgery and like I said, all you need to do is a paramblical rectus sheath blocks to go around 3-4 centimeters medial, uh, just above the umbilicus on the lateral side and feel for the pop through the anterior rectus sheath. Uh, move a little bit in until you feel the bounce over the posterior rectus sheath and deposit local anesthetic on either side. Works very well for the paramblical hernias. This is a very extensive incision, also known as the Mercedes-Benz incision, a rooftop incision, or bilateral cockers incision. If you're actually uh, you know, doing uh, anesthesia for this kind of surgery, you need to do a rectus sheath block bilaterally and tab block below the costal margin. Okay, combination of this rectus sheath block and subcostal tab block is also described as subcostal tab uh, okay, by Peter Hebert, but that is an ultrasound guided uh, technique where long needle is used and you go from the uh, ziphoid 
uh, just follow the uh, subcostal margin and keep injecting local anesthetic. So you move from doing a rectal sheath block to a tap block uh, from one point to the other. So that is the subcostal tap. But here you combine just the rectal sheath block, loss of resistance block you give on the top, uh, you know, the first two quadrants, uh, top quadrants, and the uh, tap block just below the costal margin. This is a problem paramedian incision, sometimes used uh, for like dew perf. In this case, uh, again, you can actually do a rectus sheath block uh, on one side because the paramedian, so just uh, doing a uh, two point rectus sheath block on the side of incision. But it is usually left sided incision, so uh, left sided uh, rectus sheath block is done. Now, laparoscopic surgeries, uh, some people believe that local infiltration is more than enough, but if you're doing local infiltration, ask your surgeons to do the local infiltration before the surgery. Uh, so, if you are doing a standard laparoscopic, you want to do the blocks, you need to do the rectus sheath block. So, you do rectus sheath block on the top, that is at the, just below the, uh, the ziphys turner, and you do a paramolecular block uh, for the port which is going to go in from lipo and you normally see that there are two ports on the right sides and that can be covered by the right sided tap block you again need to discuss with the surgeons if your patient is obese they might actually do uh, you know a port on the right on the left side as well in that case uh, doing a four segment or four quadrant tap blocks also work pretty well for these cases so this is, uh, I think, looks uh, like a surgery uh, for uh, abdominal hysterectomy. Uh, so there's multiple ports. They go above. So unlike unlike uh, in the uh, your uh, laparoscopic cholestectomy, the port is coming above from the above. Okay. So you need to do a paramolecular rectus sheath block because this is the port is coming from above, and uh, you can do bilateral tap blocks. So these are for laparoscopic hernia surgery, uh, total laparoscopic hysterectomy, or lap-assisted vaginal hysterectomy. You need to discuss and find out where the incision and ports are going to be. And accordingly, if you know the surgical anatomy, you can actually do the block. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a classical tap block we are actually showing here. Uh, so this is uh, using a needle through needle technique. I take a big needle, pierce the skin, and through that, I'm going to introduce a long block needle. Now, these block needles we use for nerve stimulator techniques or for ultrasound. These are short barrel, and so you can actually see the bounce. You can actually see, so you need to actually feel for a bounce and then feel for a click as you go through the first there. Okay, yeah. Okay, so first to the external oblique. It's also important that if you are not actually feeling the clicks properly, you angle, angle your needle, okay, you angle it cordially or cranially, because sometimes the fibers actually tend to split rather than you actually feeling the pop, you just actually see it. The, the fascias may not be as strong, especially in the elderly patients. And once you have got it, you don't actually need to hold it. The tissues will hold the needle. This is a let go technique. You always aspirate every, after every 5 ml of the local anesthetic injection. And once you're injected. So in this case, I actually also did an ultrasound uh, to just show how the local anesthetic actually has spread. And if you actually observe uh, that closely, you will actually see that on the screen, uh, you can actually see the external oblique, internal oblique, and you can actually see transverse abdominis, uh, which is actually pushed down, and that is uh, called the lens effect. Uh, and that. so, uh, this here, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So this is the um, showing the landmarks. Uh, so on the right side, of the cranial end, so you can actually see a uh, weave shape, that's a ziphoid, and we have marked the four points where we are going to give uh, the uh, rectus sheath. So we can actually see that as a paramolecule because this is a patient who was going to actually have a laparoscopic cholestectomy. So two marks below the ziphys sternum and two just above the umbilicus. So on the top is the head end where you can see the inverted V. And we also going to actually do a subcostal block just below tap, subcostal tap below the your costal margin in the mid axillary line. 
So these these are the things. So uh, we tend to mark. So this was was actually in a uh, in a workshop. So it's uh, nicely shown. So we have actually gone along the costal margin. Keep following it. Keep following it. Tell you you reach the anterior axillary lines and go slightly below the anterior axillary lines. So sort of uh, midway between the anterior and posterior. So uh, mid axillary line. I would say that. Okay. So those are the uh, important uh, landmarks uh, for the thing. Yeah, okay. So here I'm. Uh, this is a block we're going to show. This is one of the techniques. So in all patients, you can actually hold the skin, pinch the skin, and this is important in patients who have uh, or obese or patients who have very lax skin. We can use that technique: pinch it, go through the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. And then you start actually feeling uh, for the the bounce. Okay, so it's always bounce and pop, bounce and pop. So keep bouncing it. Your fascia are tough. You feel okay. So uh, you tend to actually feel two two bounces. Okay, so bounce on the external oblique, then bounce on the internal oblique at you. So once you felt the uh, pop through the internal oblique, then you will actually deposit the local anesthetic. Uh, for the uh, tap block. So this is the subcostal uh, tap or the or tap block below the costal margin. Next uh, we will actually see the rectus sheath blocks and um, okay so this is the first approach you can actually see that this has been done uh, just above the umbilical so this is the paraumbilical rectus sheath block and uh, once you actually feel for the bounce uh, over the uh, posterior rectus sheath, you are actually going to deposit the local anesthetic over the posterior rectus sheath. You do not actually pierce the posterior rectus sheath. And like I said, the tougher one is the anterior rectus sheath. And uh, the uh, posterior rectus sheath is actually much thinner, so it's easy to pierce. So avoid piercing the uh, posterior rectus sheath. So even if it pierces, you're not going to actually do any harm. Okay, okay, okay. Now this is the technique uh, we actually use. So here, a blunt needle is used, and we can actually feel the bounce on the on the uh, posterior rectus sheath. It looks like the uh, video of that stopped. Okay, you can. So here you're actually seeing the bounce on the posterior rectus sheath. And you inject the local anesthetic, and uh, you will actually see something beautiful here. And this is this is very very important to understand uh, with the loss of resistance blocks, landmark loss of resistance blocks. So we injecting 0.25 percent uh, liver bupivacin at each point. So here we would have used 40 mLs uh, to 60 mLs. Okay, we actually can see that. The local anesthetic. Bar. So this only happens if you're in the right plane. If you're in the muscle, so if you're injecting local anesthetic, you're in the muscles. You're not, not in the right plane. The local anesthetic will get actually seep into the muscle fibers, and you will never see this uh, return back. You don't see this return back as well uh, all the time in the uh, uh, you know uh, thinner needles or in needles which have got external tubing. But uh, with hypodermic needle, you always actually see this uh, very, very well. Okay. So coming to this <coughs> end of this lecture, uh, so we're going to just summarize the whole thing. So uh, as a part of the general anesthesia, <coughs> we need to go through the pre-op checklist. We have the IV access and monitoring. And once we have that, then we do the, uh, the induction of anesthesia. And you, all you need need is profile. You don't need anything. Else. No opioids. If you give the right dose of profile, you can actually insert the supraglottic devices very uh, easily. Once uh, the patient is uh, breathing spontaneously, so before I give the block, actually I keep them on oxygen, nitrous oxide, and sevoflurane. It does two things. One thing, nitrous oxide actually provides analgesia yeah, uh, for the block. Second thing, I'm building up. The by the second gas effect, building up the concentration for sevoflurane uh, much more quickly. And once this is happening, now I also give IV dexamethasone and IV diclofenac. You don't 
want to give these to drugs in patients who are awake because dexamethasone is painful and it also can cause perianal itching. Ibudiclofenac need to be diluted in minimum of 20 ml and if possible 100 ml of saline and give us as an infusion. So once this is done, then the, rectus, uh, the regional anesthesia technique is done, whether you do rectal sheath block, tap block, depends on the surgery, type of surgery. So knowing the surgical anatomy, discuss with your surgeon always, where it is going to cut, where the ports are going to be, what technique are they going to use, are they going to use mesh, are they going to use tacks. Okay, you need to actually know that, and that's why it's very, very important to have good communication uh, with the uh, surgeons. Intraoperatively, tend to give IV magnesium sulfate, okay, and if I'm not able to actually give block for whatever reason, then I can actually use lignocaine and be mindful that the surgeon may also be using local infiltration. So you need to be actually very clear in how much amount of local anesthetic the surgeons can use uh, for local infiltration if you're not using block techniques. Then uh, before the operation uh, ends, 20 minutes before, I give the IV paracetamol. But if you have not used block, you can actually use IV paracetamol uh, with small dose of tramadol. You just need 25 uh, for females and 50 milligrams uh, for a big uh, built or well built patients. Uh, you can give it at the beginning rather than give it at the end of the surgery. And then at the end, you reverse everything and you take the patient to the recovery. And don't forget to prescribe analgesia, uh, regular analgesia, and antiemetics. Okay, the analgesia to be, if possible, given by mouth and by the clock. Remember, by the by mouth, by clock. Okay, and for at least 36 to 48 hours minimum. Okay, and after that, they can always go on as and when required. So if you look at abdominal thoracic surgery, there are somatic component and visceral components. For somatic component, you can use regional anesthesia technique, whether you use abdominal block, you use parotid block, erector spinal block, spinal opiates or epidural, do use it as part of your technique. For visceral pain, you can use multimodal analgesia, uh, which uh, all patients can get dexamethasone without any doubt, diclofenac, even if they have region magnesium sulfate. Using other agents like lignocaine, uh, if you're not going to use regional anesthesia technique. Using clonidine infusion, dexmetomidine infusion along with or without ketamine. Paracetamol with or without tramadol will depend on whether you have used regional anesthesia technique to your advantage or not. So guys, multimodal analgesia is part of every technique, whether you're using regional anesthesia alone as these technique always give them at least two or three components of the multimodal analgesia. Everybody should actually get dexamethasone, right? They should get non steroidal if they have no contraindication to it. And you can use magnesium sulfate without any problem if you use as an infusion. Okay? Paracetamol is a very safe drug to use. It can be given orally. You can even start your multimodal analgesia in the preoperative period. You can prescribe oral paracetamol, you know, ibuprofen uh, with, with or without PPIs, okay. And uh, oral diclofenac, oral diclofenac, you can get uh, in a coated uh, tablets, uh, slow release tablets as well now. And then use, uh, you can use fixed dose combinations like paracetamol with tramadol for post-op analgesia, especially in patients uh, who have low pain threshold or patients uh, who actually have history of, you know, uh, painful surgeries in the past or bad experience in the past. Thank you everyone for listening to this lecture and uh, we can have some question-answer sessions.